Welcome to Breaking Bread. I'm your host, Khalil Chapman from the Kingmakers of Oakland Street Team, where we put on events, build community, and highlight people in our community who are doing amazing work. Today, we're here with OUSD's Program Manager for Early Childhood Education and the Office of AAMA and the Office of Equity, Brother Taji Brown. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Brother Khalil, for having me. How are you doing? How's the family? Man, the family's doing good. It's Saturday, so it's just a rest day, but then preparing for Monday when school opens back up. Man, that's right. That's <laughs> right. I mean, just as in that in that field, it's important to have those um, daily practices or those things that we do that just get us grounded and get us ready um, for the week. So just to start, take us back, man, to just growing up. And you're from the South Bay, correct? Yes. Yeah. So take us back. What was it like growing up in that community um, and just being a, a, a young person um, in the South Bay? Yeah. So I grew up in Menlo Park in the Bellhaven community. Um, I always say back in the day when um, right across the street from East Palo Alto, there's just that um, street light that separates us. So grew up back in the day when East Palo Alto was known as the murder capital of the U.S. Um, growing up, grew up in an area where I was fortunate to where I had both my parents in the home. So my mother mm -hmm. and my father. Um, growing up also, um, our grandparents were alive, so we would go see them. My father's father, my, grand, my grandpapa, he passed while while I was young, but was able to build that relationship with him. But then also we just had a whole sense of community. So the church I grew up in, mm. um, it was like a big family. Then also um, Onetta Harris Community Center, Kelly Park, where I um, spent a lot of my days. And then um, from there was provided great exposure to different things outside of our community. So it was just great. So we would have those family road trips where we would go on vacation together and just relax. And then, um, as everybody, you know, church all day Sunday, so I enjoyed that, sung in the choir, right. directed the choir. <laughs> okay. Um, and then during the week, be that kid, go to school or go over to Netta Harris where we play basketball. Um, my brothers, they excelled in it. They was really dedicated to it. I just did it for fun. And yeah. then just hung around the neighborhood with all my friends. Well, no, that's important. It, it really sounds like there was um, kind of this interconnectedness within the community where um, parts were moving, but people were synced up, families were synced up. Can you speak to how powerful it was to be able to have trust in the church family and the uh, Parks and Recs family and being able to go to community centers and things like that? And we don't really see that much anymore, but what's the power in that for you? Power in that was during the time that I grew up, everybody was family. So uh, yeah. I ain't going to sit here and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hated it at times because I grew up when um, my parents gave people the permission to spank us. Um, so Ooh. it was like everybody, so, you know, if an adult That's caught us doing day. something, you know, we could get in trouble because we were made to respect our elders. But then it was that trust. So, um, like at the church, our families to where it's just been generations to where today we're still close knit as family. Absolutely. Um, but then at the community center that I grew up, that became family. So it was 12 of us that linked up one one who's um, passed away, but we are, we're still like brothers to this right. day to where even where um, one um, Miss Smith, who was um, there, who's been like a mentor and a second mother to me. Then we have Vanessa, who r pretty much ran yeah. the community center with um, Aaron Johnson, who's no longer there. But it was just that community to where if they said anything to my parents it was, uh, on. It was on i didn't care if it and but what my parents would tell us was that it was our responsibility to respect adults even if they were in the wrong we had to come tell our parents and talk to our parents about right. it we as children we could not correct an adult so if we corrected that adult even if we were right we got in trouble because my parents wanted us to know that you have to respect adults you have to respect our elders in the community so it was it was a good time and it was a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it definitely, it looked like it, it really sets that moral standard um, mm -hmm. and, and where that value is at. Just given um, kind of how we're connected in that early childhood um, education field, what was it like um, being a, a kid in the, in the school system at that point in your life as an early, um, in early childhood uh, education? I always say that um, I was a good, I was good academically. <laughs> So I, I was blessed. I, I, I got good grades. Um, however, so when you would get that report card home, it would have A's, B's to where uh, 
I broke one of my auntie's banks to where none of my nieces or nephews were able to get um, paid for their grades, but <laughs> it would be like A's, B's, A, 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 A. But then you had that citizen section. And when you would get there, it would be all oh, needs improvement because I, I was the one who would clown. I was the one who would act out, would get in trouble, yeah. um, didn't care. Until about the fourth grade where um, I always talk about her, Ms. Marty Hargrove, my fourth grade teacher. Um, it was one of the teachers who everybody's like, you don't want this teacher because she still believed in the whoopings. Oh, so yeah. one day in class, she's like, hold your hand out. I held my hand out. She hit me with the pat on my hand. And I took it. I hit her back and she stepped back and she was like, but from there, she began to really what? infuse into me history. Okay. Um, where I come from, who I was as a black man, who I was just as a black person, African-American, to where she began to make me look at history different to where I began to change some things because it was like, okay, I'm no longer just doing this for myself, but now I'm walking on the shoulders of those who have died in the past. And so right. now it's not just me excelling, but if I excel, then my community excels. So. Growing up, it was that that's the era, that's the um, surroundings that I had. And then um, Mr. DeWitt, who exposed me to the bridge program, and that gave me a new opportunity to see life on the other side of Menlo Park in, um, in the private school sector, uh, mm -hmm. where, because I was in public school, so I went to uh, Ravenswood School District my whole time. That's what I graduated from. But he showed me that other side, the private schools, and exposed me to a whole nother part of education that I was just like amazed with. Right, right, no, but something I, that, that you brought up that I really wanna make sure we touch on is just the idea, and we see it so often just in, in our school districts, is that young kings and queens can have so much energy, be so full of life, um, and be brilliant and intelligent in many, in many ways, but um, often don't have that educator, don't have that person tap in with them in the right time or early enough. Um, to where they're actually able to see who they are, whose they are, their identity. Um, and so I, I think that's really dope that you were able to have that in fourth grade pretty early, you know what I'm saying, and, and be able to um, have access to those opportunities. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a little kid? A criminal defense, well, two things. Um, a preacher oh, the and church. a criminal defense attorney. Um, preacher because I grew up in a church and it was just a part of me. It was is who I am. But then the criminal defense attorney because I just saw a lot of my friends who um, got in trouble. Yeah. And and as I said, I was exposed to the other side to where I saw people who were able to get off on technicalities. But friends that I knew who got caught up, those same technicalities was not there or it available the for them story, yeah. because they couldn't afford an attorney. So I really wanted to do that. So my goal was really to practice law. Wow. That, that's pretty tight. I, I do think um, there, there are certain aspirations or certain dreams that, that kids have, but practicing law as a, as a young one to help your friends or to help, like that's not only noble, but that's like just mad mature as a, as a young person. Um, but who inspired you growing up? Um, several individuals, um, my parents, my father, because he taught us work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, we would just see him going to work every day. <laughs> um, also, um, man, he could do, he could build anything. Um, and then my mother who showed us selflessness, um, to where she was just there 24 seven. I don't think, I think remembering her first going to work, was when we, uh, when my younger brother hit about middle school, I mean, began to start school, mm -hmm. and then she went to work and she was a yard supervisor at our school. So, um, but them, and then just how they showed us just what, how to be. And then um, the church I grew up at, um, my, my, my pastor there, Dr. H.L. Bostic, late Dr. Bostic, where she just showed us like how you could just, your discipline and being um, committed to God, what it can pay off. And then, mm. as I say, my fourth grade teacher, Miss Marty Hargrove, um, she changed my whole life where she showed me really what education was about. Um, we have um, Vanessa and Aaron who ran the center there in, in um, Onetta Harris. Then we have Miss Smith who 
still my mentor to today, um, Mr. DeWitt, who helped me with exposure. And then we began to go into history. I really fell in love with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., okay. especially with the I Have a Dream speech. So that was something that was just impactful to me. And then Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, just because of their oratory skills and how intellectual and how intelligent they were as black men. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's definitely clear the community, um, their impact and how that inspired you and how that keeps you grounded to um, really who you are, but also the dream of um, yeah, MLK and, and Malcolm X as well, just keeping us grounded to the work um, always. What would, what would you, if you had the opportunity, what would you tell the 10-year-old or 12-year-old Taji? Who, what would I tell myself? Let's see, that would be... Ooh, 20 years ago. <laughs> I would tell myself to stay the course that life gets better, but prepare and learn every lesson that life has to offer. Do not take it for granted for even the obstacles and the failures are who and what will make you into the man that you will become. So don't hide from your failures, but accept them and continue to move forward. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a great message. As a young person to hear that, um, that, that makes me think like, sometimes we don't wanna struggle. Like the hardest thing ever is to like understand that it's gonna be hard. Like it's gonna be tough for um, a certain amount of time, but there's always a lesson that comes out of that. There's always something important that you can learn and that you can take from that. So I think that's a, a great thing. And the young Tazi would be <laughs> enlightened to, to hear that. Um, to, but taking it back to school, um, so you mentioned going to, going to private school. What was that experience like, um, private high school? Because I know we, we share that in common. Ooh, that was a different world. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I mean... First of all, just that exposure to individuals who would never have to work a day in their life or had no care per se from my perspective, Absolutely. where money was not an issue to them. So that was like amazing. But then expectations. Mm -hmm. Ex the expectation so to where you were just expected to succeed right failure was not an option um so i i, yeah. I always think back to where um i mean i hate to say it and and it's being recorded now but like <laughs> i slept a whole year through um chemistry so wow. i would go to class and i would just sleep yeah and um <laughs> and i got a b and my and one of my friends she came up to me and she saw I got to be. She was like, now, Taji, what would have happened if you stayed awake? Um, and I was just like, man. But then I also saw just how some families, I'm not going to say all, they were wealthy and rich with money, but bankrupt in love. Mm. So it taught me to appreciate my family Absolutely. even the more. Um, it taught me to appreciate my parents even the more because I would see just by what I would see. And then just, man, as a black man, as a black boy there, I wasn't a man then, but as a black boy there and probably one of about four or five. And then I was the only black male in my class of graduating wow. to where it was just like a dream come true to where it was like I had no choice but to succeed because... My it's ancestors were dependent upon me. Absolutely. It's you and the ancestors. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. So it was just like, man, I just sit back. Even to this day, I just be like, but, but then I made relationships and I was mm -hmm. able to build community with individuals and learn, as I always say, able to learn a whole nother side of life Absolutely. that I probably would have never been exposed to. And for that, to this day, I'm extremely grateful because it taught me all kind of life lessons. Absolutely, and and we can talk about private schools if it's 
this am amazing, you know, and it is an amazing experience um, for, for those who get to experience it, but it does have um, some drawbacks or some things that could mm -hmm. be more of a negative experience for, for brothers that look like a, us. Is there something or is there a difference in kind of the rigor or the curriculum that you felt was just like, yo, I'm in a different space, like? Whoa. Um, <laughs> yes. Because when I got to, when I got there, in my mind, you know, was doing so well in school. But when I got there, it was like a whole different level um, to where I felt like I was a grade behind. I was one step behind mm -hmm. always because um, rigor was pushed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget it. Rigor was pushed like never before. So. Um, when I got there, the A through G requirements that we talk about um, in public schools, it was like when I got there, it was like you're put on a university track. Yeah, so uh, you're, we're not looking for you to just graduate. We're not looking for you to go to a community college or something. You're on a university track. So A through G is automatically required. So now you have to do what it is to stay here. Um, and it was, just, it was, it was like, and we're not taking down. Yeah. So, um, I started off, um, in algebra. So every subject I did, I had, it was like, you don't have a choice. Th this is a co this is college prep. This yeah. is private. So we're prepping you to go to college. Now, if you decide not to go to college, that's, that's your you. choice, yeah. but that's what we're here for. So if this is not what you want, then you may want to rethink it and, <laughs> Pretty much that's how it was packaged. You may want to rethink it because this is who we are. Right. Versus in the public schools, what I've seen is you have the choice. So uh, you're able to decide what class you're going to take or what classes you're not going to take and what path you're going to go down. Damn. And so the expectation is not there unless you meet that one particular individual who's like, no, you're going to make it, you're going to be somebody. So we're going to make sure and we're going to yeah, follow gonna you all the way you, through. Yeah. yeah. But in, in private schools, it's automatic. You paid the money, so we're automatically invested. Absolutely. One, one thing that I think is powerful is that you were the only um, black male in your graduating class. Um, just given that, what are some like, lessons you feel like you learned from that like, for your identity and just for yourself as a person moving into the college space and um, post high school? How to advocate. Mm. Um, and that's a big one. How to speak up because, I, you know, as the only black male in my class and as a black male coming from the East Menlo Park area, I felt I had to advocate. So if there was something I needed, I had to ask for it. Okay. I had to say what it was that I needed. But then I just learned. I also learned who I was and became comfortable with me. Mm. Um. I had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> I had no choice. So <laughs> I, I so high school taught me who I was and to be comfortable with me. Um, be comfortable with my differences, be comfortable with um my choices. Right. Um so that that's really what it did. So when I got to college, I was comfortable in choosing what it was. I was comfortable in choosing the school. I was comfortable in choosing classes. I was comfortable right. with interacting with whoever. But then it also, with high school, it broadened my exposure to where I was able to build community even outside of my community. Exactly. So that, that it really did. So it, it, yeah, man, high school, I learned Taji. That's right. That's important too, because especially when there's not many um, that, that look like you are from the same walk of life. Like it is important to be able to feel confident in yourself, be able to be secure in your decisions. Um, and for a lot of us, it takes a long time to come to that point, especially being in predominantly white spaces or predominantly wealthy spaces. Um, that's, that can be an intimidating thing. Um, but speak a little bit about like where you went to college, like just that the college experience and then like what you wanted to do going forward. Okay. So college, as I said, I wanted to be a lawyer, so I started off at Tuskegee University. So I went to Tuskegee, and I was majoring there in political science. But uh, man, Tuskegee did it didn't not get along. Get along. <laughs> was I it too fun, too distracting? In the middle of the country. 
<laughs> I was a city boy, um, but I transferred to the University of Alabama Birmingham, where I okay. where I began to major in um, where I majored in criminal justice. But Tuskegee, it opened me up to a whole nother level of blackness. Exactly, because you had every avenue, every aspect of the African diaspora, every aspect of blackness there. So it, it taught me me all over again. Yeah. Um, but then it also pushed me because there at Tuskegee was the first time that I had male teachers, mm -hmm. especially black male teachers. Um, and then when I went to the University of Alabama, Birmingham, was there studying um, criminal justice. So my goal was to become a lawyer and to work. So I was really looking at probation. Okay. And, and to start there, but I was going to go to law school and all that. But after I graduated, that got interrupted where I went to work at a residential facility. And once there, my life changed to where I stayed within social services, working in um, residential facilities. Then um, as a case manager, um, did that for years. And then as a social worker. And and just knowing you, like, how was that experience, like, being in that field for a while and actually, like, creating relationships and doing, like, doing the work? How how was that? Because I could really only imagine it, social work a couple of ways. It was hard. Um, but it was beneficial. Mm -hmm. Hard where um, I am an optimistic person. So um, being a social worker was probably one of the greatest experiences that I've had, but one of the hardest because as a social worker, you actually met some families at their worst state. Absolutely. And at that worst state, some were not able to recover. Yeah. But others were. Um, and then also you just saw you saw the worst to where it could um, make you like reevaluate reevaluate can't even think of the word it just makes you it makes you hard mm -hmm. to where life you just you just look at people in different different way um, but then also it just makes you value life. It makes you value family. It makes you value your upbringing. It makes you mm -hmm. um, grateful for your parents, grateful what you've been through. Because now as a social worker, even as a case manager, my job really, I built those relationships with those families. I, I was there to support them. As a social worker, make sure the child was safe, but then making sure permanency for that family as a case manager, I was an advocate for families. I okay. was there to say, hey, let's do this. Um, I'll never forget one of my, one of the youths I work with, they got mad at me because in front of their parents, I'm like, yeah, you gotta explain the why. <laughs> if they're saying why, you gotta explain that. And then when we get by ourselves, I'm like, they don't have to tell you why. They're the parent, <laughs> you're the child. They're taking care of your every need. Yeah. So you should be doing what it is that they want. So I understood both worlds mm -hmm. and I was able to infuse that. And so I, I enjoyed it. Um, to this day, I, 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 I enjoyed it. I did. It was it, it brought life. Um, now, I don't my, I don't miss the hours. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't miss the caseloads, <laughs> but a but the work. work the work I love, but then that work transitions over into what I do now. So right. I, I just, I'm still doing the same thing, just in a different way. Absolutely. And before we transition, what, what did that work kind of tell you about like where, our, where we're at as a country, like where our people are, like just in terms of like the climate, what did that, what did that work insinuate? That work, <laughs> that we have work to do. Mm. It showed me that our values are really not there. It showed me, for some it showed me that families are strong and in times of, um, times of hardships, family can come together. Absolutely. But then it also just showed me that 
some people are just not meant to be parents. Mm. And, and as individuals, I think we have to come to that realization to understand who it is that we are. Um, because I would always hear, the government just wants to raise my children, so they're telling me what to do. And, I would, and, and my wife gets mad. She would get mad at me because they'd be like, yeah. But it's like, no, they're not. Nobody's telling you how to raise your children. As we're just trying to make sure that children are safe. But at the same time, what I began to see was children raising children. Mm. And so when I saw that, then it was like, now we have a problem because you having parents who are still growing, trying to grow up themselves or not settle, and then now they're caring for another child. And instead of putting the child's needs before their needs, they're putting their needs before the child's need. And I'm, and so for me, that was a contradiction. That was something that I was not, yeah, problematic, because I wasn't used to that, because I saw my parents put our needs before their needs. Mm -hmm. And so I had to wrestle with that. And, and so that was the hardship to where I had to come to realize that some some people were not just meant to be parents and that yes some children needed to be removed from their homes but then let's look for family members who were able to build that community and take care of that child and yeah. be that be that um, undergirding of the family so that we didn't have to be in a life but that family was able to help family the village the village Absolutely. and and so that that's that that's what I was do, trying to do. That that was my whole goal was to rebuild the village. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's a very that's a very powerful sentiment. Just given, yeah, babies can't raise babies, um, and and given all that that babies require, um, and that that the youth require, it, it is the the village that's going to be necessary. Um, just moving forward, what 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 caused like just the switch or the transition into education? Well, so we moved back to California, and um, I applied for jobs, and I was going to go back into social work. Mm -hmm. And I happened to go on the Oakland Unified School District website, and as I was browsing through the jobs, I happened to see Program Manager, African American Male Achievement, and working, and it said working with males and and once I saw that, I was like, yes. So I applied. Um, I interviewed. As I always say, I didn't think I had the job <laughs> <laughs> because um, I was grilled. Um, yeah. I was asked, I was, I was, and so I walked out of there like, okay. But I, I got the job. And, and what made me, what, what, what it was was that I did want to come in to focus on working with are African-American males. Mm -hmm. and that, that was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to work with males. I wanted to um, help restore and change a narrative Absolutely. about males. And so that's what really triggered it and that's why I'm here is to help reshape, revamp. Nah, let's not reshape, let's not revamp to change the whole narrative in regards to black males and males in general. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just something on that on that note, what sparks like, th like that is absolutely vital in terms of teacher retention and, and getting black men, but what sparks the passion um, in, the, in the everyday work, in the meetings, in the, just the program design, like what sparks the passion? Because um, I know you're a very passionate cat, you love to show up, um, be with the students, be with um, all of the fellows. Um, but what, what really drives that, that energy? As I said, I, I was fortunate to where I have my father in the house growing up. Mm -hmm. So um, when I went into social services as a, so and as a social worker, I came to understand that everybody did not have that. Right. Um, and so for me, and then when I went to Tuskegee, and saw the black men there teaching. Yeah. And then at UAB, um, I'll never forget him. He was one of the provosts in the office that I work in, Dr. Dale. Um, he, <laughs> Dr. Dale. Uh, he, 
I mean, he changed my whole outlook on life also just because of who he was. Absolutely. Um, to where I want to give back and to make a difference and really um, even talking with kings in OUSD when they said if we had a male teacher or if we had a black teacher or if we had a Hispanic male teacher who looked like us, our, traje our trajectory and our education would be different Absolutely. and it would be much further because they understand who understand who we are. It makes me show up because what I'm trying, what I want to do is bring that. I want to bring that image, bring that mirror, bring that door so that our young scholars can know, especially our young kings, that the sky is the limit. You can achieve anything you Absolutely. want. And so my, my goal is to put somebody in front of them who looks like them. To where it's like, oh my God, okay, let me do this. Because we are given a whole bunch of images in society. Exactly. And all the images we're given, majority of the time, if they look like us, they're either an entertainer, mm -hmm. rapper, gangster, or an athlete. Yeah. But I want to show our young scholars, our young kings, that... We're not just basketball players, football players, athletes, gangsters, rappers, all that. But we have some intellectuals. We have some businessmen. We have exactly. some lawyers. We have some teachers. And if we put that in front, then now we're giving them more choices, more options. Exactly. We're exposing them to more. And so it makes me go hard in the paint every day. So when I'm in a meeting or when I get to the school, it's like, yeah, I'm seeing these young scholars and they're just looking and they're happy. They're excited right. to be there. So it just makes me, it makes me, it makes me go hard. It, it, it pushes me even when I'm tired and I don't want to do it. It's just like, bam, add fuel to the flame. And then the other part is also because I have two young sons myself Absolutely. and I want to make sure that they're able, even though they're not in the Oakland Unified School District, that they're able to see something, someone who looks like them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the message of Sankofa to take what you know um, and to pass it and to be of that knowledge, one, I, I think is um, incredibly commendable. And, and thank you just for your work and your program design and your leadership, um, but also just understanding the need. Um, that that kings need that mirror like there has to be somebody representative of what we go through somebody to show us like like you said these are all the options that are possible um, at this point just given our connection shameless plug um, <laughs> I, I do want you to talk a little bit about our program um, and and yeah kind of tie it back into what you were talking about but more specifically just what our program is about um, how people could maybe apply or get in touch with you um, yeah, and, and maybe a little more. Yeah, so the Early Literacy King Project, um, Men of Color Project, Men of Color Early Literacy Project and what it was called. But as Khalil said, he's part of the program to where our first year um, fellows, our first year kings, they named the project to take ownership of it and they came up with Early Literacy Kings. Um, is we're working with transitional kindergartners in the Oakland Unified School District um, doing reading intervention with them using the SEEDS curriculum. Um, and it's just, we're going, there, they are, Khalil and the other Kings. They're in there every day, Monday through Friday, working with groups of young scholars um, on their reading, making sure that they're learning because our goal is to make sure that our young scholars are on grade level. But the overall goal is to make sure that they're above grade level. But at the same time, is looking to expose these kings to the education field, to come back as teachers. Um, um, man, I, I, everyone that's part of the program, I'm like, man, okay, I think you could do this. <laughs> uh, what about this? Like, uh, Khalil, with him, we've been working. It's like, okay, no, 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 let's go a little bit this route because we see the greatness that's in them. And even um, I've gone in and saw them online and then I've gone into the classrooms when we went back in and just to see how they interact because the main premise, even though we're doing intervention, the main premise is to come from a place of love, love, love and acceptance. And so accepting the students where they are and working with them. And so it's just been great. Um, you can reach me uh, at Taji Brown. 
Taji.Brown at OUSD.org. Um, T-A-J-I, is how you, T-A-J-I is how you spell my first name. Um, we're still in the process of looking for kings. Um, so men of color. Um, so we're looking for our African king, African American kings, our African kings, um, our Latino kings, our Arabic kings, our Asian kings, our yep. Pacific Islander kings, um, our Arabic kings, our Native American kings. Because we're we're and then we're bringing you in because it's you, who, it's the kings who are doing the work. Absolutely, I'm just here to support. Um, I just get the I, I have the best job ever. I get to come in and support kings like Khalil and see how they're doing and then work with them on a um on their goals and and help orient them and so it's a cascade mentorship kind of program. I mentor them, they're mentoring the younger scholars, but yes, it's great. Um uh, we would love for you to come Absolutely. on board and come work through. with us. Um uh, we're starting school Monday, but we're still, we have application. Our, our, our schools need you. Our, our young scholars need you. Our community needs you. That's right. That's and that's right. what it's really about. Our community needs you. And if we can, and then it's, it's our kings coming back to serve their community. And so, um, yeah, so all, all you have to be is a high school graduate and a man of color. That's it. That's right. And just hit me up. Um, also, you can contact me. I am on social media, Taji T. Brown on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, so if you want this opportunity, just hit us up. Um, we're, we're, we would love to have you. Absolutely, and thank you just for adding some context um, to a little bit of, of, of the background there. Yeah, we, we really do wanna change the narrative um, and, and provide a space and a platform for you to come back and, and feel and see and be the impact. Um, because yeah, we, we have to bridge the gap and, and, and provide more youth in the teaching space, provide more black and brown brothers and sisters in the teaching space, um, but also make it uh, a different thing and make people feel differently about coming back and teaching um, because it's really important. Before we wrap up, um, quick game called This or That <laughs> uh, for Brother Taji. Um, so we're going to start just something real light, choose one or the other, um, and we're going with their whole body of work. All right. The first one, Nas or Jay-Z? I'll go with Jay-Z. Jay-Z, Okay. The second one, Erica or Jill Scott? Erica. Okay. We're disagreeing, we're disagreeing on these first two, but <laughs> the third one, uh, Denzel Washington or Eddie Murphy? Denzel. Oh, okay. Fourth one, loyalty or respect? Mm, that's a good one. Got him thinking. I'm going to say respect because you can't be loyal without respect. That's right. And that's a good one. This last one, I'm going to ask you to just explain or extrapolate. Would you rather travel to the past or to the future? Truthfully, neither. Be in the moment in the present? I like to be in the moment in the present because everyone's always asked if you can go back and back years and take the knowledge that you have now, would you do it? No. Because if I travel back with the knowledge I have now, I wouldn't be able to learn. And to go to the future, even though it would be great, I would rather live in the moment to make it to the future because we can change narratives, we can change things along the way to make the future brighter. Absolutely. See, and that's, that's the best way to end this off. Thank you, Brother Tazi, for coming through. Um, you can check us out on kingmakersofoakland.org or you can follow us at, uh, on Twitter at KingmakersO or on Facebook and Instagram at Kingmakers of Oakland. Thank you so much one more time, Brother Tazi, for coming out. This is Breaking Bread. I'm your host, Khalil Chapman. Until next time. I'm a king. What is hate from this fire that I bring? What I speak is in my veins, in my genes.